my name is Phoebe Legere. Welcome to Roulette TV. This evening my guest is the great drummer from Richmond, Virginia, Joey Barron.
My guest tonight is the great drummer, Joey Barron. Welcome, Joey. Hi. That was a superb performance. <laughs> Thank you. I was completely <laughs> blown away. <laughs> Why did you pick up a drumstick to begin with? I heard a neighbor of mine when I was about, was about nine years old, um, and there was a a guy a couple of years older than me, and he had a snare drum that he played in the school band. And I used to hear him practicing, just banging on it in the backyard when I would take out the trash. And I was just kind of fascinated by it. And I would go walking down the alley, and I would talk to him and found out that he was going to stop playing. And, you know, we talked and worked out a deal that I would pay him 20 bucks and buy the drum at the end of the summer. So I cut grass for that summer and, and at the end of it I bought the drum and got into the school program. You swing your tush off. How did you get a hold of, you got a hold of the jazz and you really play jazz straight ahead and every kind. It's really something. Where'd you get that swing? Does it help to come from the South? I don't know. I mean, everybody's got, you know, the myth is that you have to be X. X could be age, X could be gender, X could be skin color, X could be from a certain part of the country. I mean, the older I get, the more I tend to not accept any of that. Um, I, think it's, I think it's your environment and what you are around. And um, black culture for me, that's what opened the door for me. I, I was bussed in, in the 60s. I think uh, Richmond was one of the first cities where they had busing, where they take kids from uh, a white neighborhood and bus them into a neighborhood of color or, and vice versa. You know, that was an attempt at that time to try and just break the walls. And so for me, one of the uh, key things was um, I was bused and the school that I was bused into uh, was a predominantly um, black high school. And the ratio was supposed to be 50-50. That's what the, that was the aim. And, you know, racism being the ugly thing that it is, it didn't work out that way because a lot of uh, uh, people just refused to go along with it. So kids dropped out and whatever. But I went and the band director at that school, his name was Tuscan Jasper. Uh, he was incredibly uh, influential in my, de in my development. And he opened up a world to me that I only knew from... Um, just the very edge of. He would just say, hey, Joey, come here. You ever heard this? And he would play me a record, and it would be um, uh, Wynton Kelly with Philly Joe Jones and uh, Paul Chambers. And he said, yeah, I was in the Army with this guy, Wynton Kelly. He Ooh. said, do you like it? And, and I would just listen to it, and I, I just loved it. And he didn't, he didn't tell me anything. He just paid attention to me and let me listen. And he listened with me. He was, he liked, he just, it was like welcome. Oh. And, and um, there was a group of uh, teachers who got together, players, and they had a big band. And their drummer was uh, not available. And, and Mr. Jasper said, hey, would you want to make these rehearsals every oh. Tuesday night? And How old were you? Uh, I was a teenager, I think, oh. like maybe... 15 or, or oh, something like that, that or 14 or 15. And, and every I, Tuesday or Wednesday, whatever it was, my dad would drive me out to this high school, John Kennedy High School. And, and um, you know, I was the only white guy. Me and my dad were the only white people there. And it was, it, I didn't know of any, you know, political thing or any, pro, you know, problems or anything. There was, it, it was just a bunch of people coming together for their love uh. of playing th that music. And that was my uh, view of the world. 
When did you come to New York? 1983, I moved here. And when did you meet John Zorn? Somewhere around 1984, I believe. Um, my entry to Zorn was actually um, through Bill Frizzell. Such a wonderful musician. <laughs> He's pretty oh. special, isn't he? Oh. <laughs> yeah, we were on a record date together, and uh, I didn't know Bill. We, we didn't know each other. I just knew the guy who called me. I think it was uh, Kenny Werner. And I was in, you know, in my little drum booth. Everybody was separated like you usually are when you record. And uh, I was getting a little fed up at something, and when they called the tune, I slammed this backbeat down. And I, I looked up, and Bill, like, I, it just it was one of those things where that backbeat just happened right at the right moment or something and Bill was <laughs> like looking at me like that and our eyes locked and and something was happening and so we that was kind of the beginning of our friendship you know like <laughs> we both looked at each other and like man did you just do that <laughs> and, yeah <laughs> so we we took each other's numbers and then we would get together in the afternoon and just um we just played we just would spend hours just playing songs or improvising or making sounds or just having fun. And at that point, I didn't know anything. I came to New York mainly to play jazz, you know. And Bill was already involved with uh, lots of people. I, you know, through him, I met Tim Byrne and Zorn and Ardo Lindsay and um, just a whole community of people who were uh, working from a different point of view. and. It was pretty jarring at first because when you come from a certain background and you're not exposed to other things, you can you kind of tend to say, "Well, <laughs> can they play, or <laughs> or what are they doing?" Or it takes a while to adjust, and that's what happened in my relationship um, with Bill at that time. He introduced me to. I mean, I remember being completely flipped out by Ikawe Mori. Oh, isn't she wonderful? Oh, she's a genius. Oh, she she is, is a genius. She really is. I use her as an example of someone who just, she just knows how to make music, you know. And, yeah. So that's how I met Zorn, for instance. And um, Bill was actually the, the door opener for all of that. And it was kind of uh, interesting to be involved with people who made their own music and rehearsed their own music. It was from a different perspective. Nobody was trying to play like anyone else. They were just playing the way they played. And that's, uh, sometimes it's hard to comprehend when you um, when you come through a, a tradition that you have to learn to do this and you learn this and you know playing jazz playing bebop there's a lot of homework that one has to have done so when you approach the bandstand you have all those things in your back pocket you know the, um, a lot of people get stuck along the way with the rules and uh, they're great rules they're, they're beautiful rules but sometimes um, it's hard to go past to where you make it your own or, or where you include yourself, your own point of view. And I think that's important, whatever genre you play or whatever you do. The joy that you feel in playing the drums is one of the joys for us in watching it. It's so, it's so infectious. Uh, tell us about the structure now. This evening you played solo drums, and some people might hear uh, uh, that they're going to hear a solo drum concert and say, oh my, I, I don't know if I can take it, and yet it is so fascinating. It's gripping. It's gripping to hear you play. Do, how do you structure these solo performances? I just walk in and I make it intimate it's like an intimate to me it's an intimate experience it's not really for <laughs> for recording or for 
I'm not thinking about that. I'm not thinking, oh, this is going to be for roulette TV or it's maybe for a CD. Um, I'm thinking this is for this moment, for these people that are here. And there's something um, I'm trying to engage. I'm not doing it to impress or wow anyone, although maybe that might end up happening. But um, I'm trying to engage people. Um, so th it's not entertainment. It's some, it's an experience to maybe, if you're a musician, maybe to present an, another view of the drum set and what's possible uh, in addition to the traditional roles that um, a drum set has or and has had in the past. Um, it's also, you might walk in off the street and you've probably had a crappy day and maybe there's something I can put out that will change even for a few minutes or a second or something, that perspective. I mean, that's, I try and engage and make it uh, an active process, not, um, not just a passive one of, of people sitting and paying attention, you know, something that they can engage their imagination in. Um, I think that's one of the things that's so great about a drum set. Uh, you can play a drum set non-specifically pitched and your ear can fill in the information that it wants to hear or that you imagine hearing. And it's different for everyone. I try and show the process of, of making music in the moment. And um, in that moment, I'm using all of my experience from the past to try to create something that moves a forward and, and, uh, and to let people be a part of that process rather than I've prepared this piece and bang, that's it. No surprises or anything. I like taking chances. I like uh, sometimes when surprises happen just out of nowhere and how to recover from those surprises or how to move them, keep moving forward. Yeah. Can you say anything to us about uh, being an artist in our culture right now? I wasn't aware of being an artist for a long time. I wasn't aware what that even meant. I, I, my background was like, I'm a worker, you know, like uh, an artist or working part of working class, I believe. Um, I found something that I really loved doing and loved being a part of, so it wasn't work to me. And my, in, in the beginning, it was like uh, I took any job that people asked me to, to do as a kid, you know, hey, you work on Saturday night? No, can I, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it was like the answer was yes to everything. And it, you just, as a working class person, you just, you do what's in front of you. you, you somebody says, you want to work? Yes, here's the job. Okay. <laughs> and that was, uh, I, I didn't come with any loaded information about how to go about being an artist. And I think being an artist is like doing something, number one, because you love it, and then trying to do it the way you initially see it. Like if I walk in tonight and all of a sudden I, I see that the concert's going to start with a mallet on a tom-tom, I don't question it. I just, just go and just do it. You know, and it might be wrong, might be right, but it doesn't matter. You just deal with it. What's the best advice you ever received about drumming? Just play the music. Play, uh, Billy Hart, he, who is just a wonderful human being. I, I, I don't know anybody that could be more supportive than Billy Hart. He is wonderful. Um, he told me a long time ago in the 70s when I first met him, um, he said, just play the music, you'll never go wrong. <laughs> Thank you very much, Joe. It was Thank wonderful you. talking with you. Thank you.